Let's take a look at some of the components of computers in the physical sense, some of the hardware. This is a little rundown on the different types of memory. Random access memory, represented by chips like this, is semiconductor memory that needs power. When the power is removed is when the computer is shut off. The bits in here revert to some random state of the material that's used to store them. So then we lose the information when the computer is shut off. This is very fast for both storage and retrieval, but it's limited to a couple of gigabytes of memory at the present time in most computers. And that memory has grown. The bigger this memory is in the computer's scratch pad area, generally the more capable the computer would be, the faster it might operate, given the constraint that its thinking unit, the central processing unit, does operate at a certain speed. But much of the time, the speed of its operation is governed by the way that memory is available or isn't available and how it has to manage the memory that it's been given. A hard disk isn't represented on this diagram because it's inside this box. Although portable hard disk units are available, we're talking here about the hard disk that's actually a part of that computer system box. A hard disk does store a lot more information than is presently accessible in RAM in most computers. It doesn't lose the information when power is shut off. It stores it in an electromechanical way. What you see here is a disk that's very flat, has a magnetic surface, and spins very rapidly. This little component here is an arm that has a read-write head, and it floats above this surface and moves back and forth so that it can access different tracks on this rotating disk. Although this device can store an awful lot of information, it's rather delicate, and it's susceptible to damage from mechanical shock. Anything that affects the distance of this arm to the surface, especially a shock so great that this arm descends and touches the surface, that's a disk crash. Very rapidly the surface is ruined and we lose the information. It does store a lot more information than RAM, typically hundreds of gigabytes, that is hundreds of billions of bytes, you can buy them even larger. Manufacturing techniques have advanced to the point where a huge amount of information can be stored on a hard disk. Most computers have one hard disk, but some computers are built with multiple hard disks, typically servers. Even some computers might have multiple hard disks, one disk backing up another, or you might obtain a portable hard disk that plugs in with a USB connector and provides this same sort of large capacity storage in a way that can be conveniently moved from one computer to another. Now the movement of data from one computer to another has been greatly speeded and the whole process eased in the last 10 years with the development of this flash memory. You see here a USB connector. This memory plugs into a USB slot. Data can be copied to it as if it were a hard drive. However, it's not electromechanical. It is semiconductor, but it uses a technique of semiconductor storage that doesn't require electrical power in order to maintain the on-off patterns in the bits. A few gigabytes of this, and you can store information on it and carry it around. It's much less susceptible to damage from mechanical shock than hard drives. Currently, the capacity isn't nearly what a hard drive might provide, but in tens of gigabytes of storage available now in a rather economical way on USB storage. It is a very handy way to convey data from one place to another and you probably have one and these drives typically cost less than ten dollars for a few gigabytes of storage. They are susceptible to damage however by electrical shock. If for example you were holding one of these and if it were a staticky sort of a day, cold dry air and you scuffed across a rug and generated a static charge, if the spark that occurs when you touch some large metal object were to go through this flash memory or its connector, you would zap it and it wouldn't work anymore. You'd lose the information you had on it because you wouldn't be able to read it anymore. That's happened to me, one flash drive out of perhaps 20 that I've used from time to time. So these things are durable but not entirely invulnerable to damage. And then we have CDs and DVD-ROMs. Now these are sort of losing out to flash memory these days because flash memory can actually have more capacity than a CD or a DVD read-only memory. These are typically write once read-only. They've been used in the past to either back up data or you're familiar with audio CDs 
or DVDs for video storage, there are cheap ways to distribute lots and lots of stored bits. And they're still common on computers. The smallest of the computers, the tablet computers and the notebook computers, don't generally have CD-ROM drives, although portable CD-ROM drives are available that plug in to a computer using a USB connector. These are not very expensive, typically under $50, and it's one way of gaining access to information stored on these types of CDs and DVDs if you don't have a drive built in the computer, but for some reason, let's say, installation of software, you needed to access a CD or a DVD-ROM on a notebook or a tablet computer. Let's take a look now inside the system unit. That's that box that the keyboard connects to. We can talk about memory as semiconductor memory. That just stores on-off patterns, but how does the computer manipulate these? What it comes down to is electrical gates. Gates that can make decisions based on electrical charges being present at one or more incoming conductors or wires. An AND gate, for example, will generate an electrical charge here only if both of these have an electrical charge on them. So if A and B let's say are true because they have an electrical charge, then C will be true also. In this case, an OR gate, a charge here or here or both places would produce a charge here. The little zero symbol or the circle symbol negates things. A NAND gate, negative AND gate, will generate a signal only if there's no charge present on both of these. You see, that circle related to this sort of a symbol negates things. So this does exactly the opposite coming out as it got in. These circuits can be used to express Boolean algebra. Now we're not going to delve very deeply into this. I only wanted you to know that these sorts of little basic components, logic components existed and they could be implemented in electronic form. When implemented that way it becomes possible to build up logic circuits using just these very tiny simple components. And this is the way that that's done. So using those symbols for those gates, an engineer or a mathematician can come up with a combination of gates that produces a desired set of output signals for given inputs. This can be built up into circuits that then produce signals that we can interpret as modified information. Here's the way it usually works. A computer has a clock that pulses every fraction of a second. During the fraction of a second between pulses, this time state, certain signals might appear and certain outputs might appear. In the next clock pulse, the signals here may change having been driven by other gates and now a different set of signals appears and a different set of outputs. So the clock pulse dictates the speed of the computer and when you see something like a chip that's rated at 1.6 gigahertz we're talking about 1.6 billion cycles per second that is these changes in the signal so the the higher the clock rate the higher the speed of the CPU the faster this sequence of changing signals can be processed and what happens is these signals represent altered information the outputs here go into other gates and very large collections of gates form units of electronic circuitry that can actually make decisions based on information content or on bits that are representing program actions. That is, actions that we want the computer to take, really a program, a program expressed in this binary way. Here's another way that gates are sometimes combined into larger circuits. The gates by themselves don't do very useful things. They're very, very tiny components, but when placed together in circuits like this that are designed to accomplish logic, a given set of inputs can cause a vast array of outputs to be generated because of the action of the gates. More and more can be combined to form various circuits that add binary numbers or uh, subtract or multiply or divide or move information from one place to another driven at the rate of change of the clock pulse, the oscillator in the computer that's generating these pulses at a very rapid rate that sort of times the operation of the entire computer. And this diagram, as opposed to this one, here we have a piece of a representation 
of logic gates arranged into some sort of a processing array, everything that you see in the prior page is contained in a little box like this. In other words, the entire circuit, of which this is just one small part, is contained in a box represented on this diagram here. And other circuits like that are combined in such a way that this represents the schematic for a, an entire computer circuit in a chip. These are the wires in and out of the chip. And the whole chip is just a small thing about the size of your fingernail. Those chips and much more complex chips might look like this. This is actually a photograph at a very small scale of one chip that would be probably about the size of a pencil eraser. Not certainly not much larger than that. They're grown on a wafer of silicon like this that's processed with various chemicals and various kinds of photographic materials called a resist, that is some sort of a coating that resists the etching of acid, leaving certain areas exposed so they can be etched, and multiple layers built up on this sort of a slice of silicon here. You see multiple chips are manufactured, and around the edges, chips that are not useful, parts of them are manufactured, because the size of these wafers vary slightly. It's the chips here that are grown this way, that look like this, having been designed with very, very large diagrams that are then photographed and photographically reduced to produce the kinds of images you see here. So here's a person's hand. You can see this is a few inches in diameter. On it are all of these chips. They're later cut apart. And these are the connection points to which wires are attached to the connectors on the case, usually little gold wires. All of these things really are transistors and other circuit elements that have been grown wired together to form this circuit. Very complex. This might contain millions of transistors arranged in all sorts of different circuits designed to be fed by signals coming in on these connectors which join into various parts of the circuitry. This is what makes modern computers possible. These are very complex, very tiny circuit components that form the heart of a computer. And so many devices these days have them in any kind of information stored electronically. At the heart has exactly this type of circuitry. Physical view of a chip, which you just saw on the prior page as one of these cut out complete chips, would be mounted on some sort of piece of plastic or ceramic. Metal like this that results in these leads that can be placed into a socket being connected to those connection points around the periphery of the chip. The chip itself would be small like this. Here's a pair of glasses and a dollar bill. Uh, sitting on it, these might be memory chips. Larger squares of this material might house the kind of a chip that is the central processing unit. And the reason that that sort of a chip is bigger than this is that there has to be enough room around the edges for the greater number of wires coming in to connect to the circuit. The circuit itself would still be small, probably about as small as this little number one here. But the case is big because all the wires that have to be physically connected to the connection points on it. And here's the way a chip might be represented in a diagram showing external components hooked up to it. This would be mounted on a motherboard and these external components are electronic components that are also present on that circuit board. This is another way that a small circuit board might look. And here these are the socket areas or the areas in which the leads from the chips would be placed and then soldered in. This is called a printed circuit because all of these etchings started as a solid plate of copper on some plastic sort of a base and photographically exposed with a chemical that resists the etching of acid so that when placed in an acid bath only these parts of the original plate remain forming conductors as well as the physical means by which a chip is attached to this board. It's not really printed. Uh, that name applied years ago when people thought these things looked printed, but actually they're etched on plastic or other kind of insulating material in this pattern that represents the circuit. So once the components are placed in this board and fastened in and soldered in, the circuit is complete. And this is the motherboard here. It's placed within a computer's case. We have a power supply here. We have the disk drive here. and perhaps a CD-ROM drive, a lot of connecting cables, a fan to cool off 
the main chip, which might be this one here, this squarish looking chip, because of the circuit components and the electricity going through them, a chip like this generates heat. It's unfortunate, but that heat is generated and wastes electrical energy and in effect can damage the chip unless it's cooled down to some degree by a fan like this. More modern chips, by the way, work at a lower amount of energy and therefore netbook computers or uh, devices like the iTouch or the iPad don't have fans in them because they use smaller amounts of power. The heat generated isn't so great as to damage the circuitry and it can be dissipated just by ordinary uh, contact with components and uh, the air circulating around a device.